I'm talking about science set free. And what science is being set free from is the science delusion. The science delusion is the belief that science has already understood the nature of reality in principle, leaving only the details to be filled in. This is very widely believed in our society. It's one of the reasons for the dogmatism that all of us encounter, uh, which is so annoying, but it's because people think they already know the truth. They sincerely believe that, um, and this is probably one of the most widespread delusions uh, in our society, and we've now exported it to the rest of the world. There's a conflict in the heart of science between science as a method of inquiry about the testing of hypotheses, looking at the evidence, finding out what's really going on, open-minded, uh, subject to correction, and so forth. The ideal of science, which many people uh, think of as what science is. Now, it's what science ought to be, and I agree with that ideal. The reality, as many of us have encountered uh, through bitter experience, is rather different. For many people, science has become a belief system, a world view. This is sometimes called scientism, where people take the dogmas of science to be a kind of religious belief system or quasi-religious belief system. And it's this dogmatic belief system which I think is now constricting and holding science back in a very serious way. In almost every branch of science, we see the law of diminishing returns. More expensive research yields fewer and fewer really new results. And I think the reason for all that is this dogmatic belief system. If science can be set free from it, uh, new experiments and new possibilities open up in every area. What I do in my book, Science Set Free, is take the ten dogmas of institutional science, which are part of the scientific worldview, and turn these dogmas into questions, treat them not as beliefs or truths, but as hypotheses that can be tested against the evidence. I then look at them scientifically to see how well they stack up uh, when you take into account the evidence. None of them do. And in every case, new possibilities open up. Uh, science becomes, would, would become regenerated uh, when we undergo this process. I don't have time to discuss all ten dogmas today, but what I'll do first is just say what they are. Um, <clears throat> and first and foremost, dogma one is the belief that nature is mechanical or machine-like. This has been the foundational principle of science since uh, the beginning of modern science in the 17th century. Mechanistic science is based on the machine metaphor. Nature is a machine. Stars are machines. Animals and plants are machines. Uh, that's why you can have industrial agriculture, genetic engineering, factory farming, and so on. They're just machines. And we're machines too, lumbering robots in Richard Dawkins' vivid phrase with brains that are genetically programmed computers. The second dogma is the total amount of matter and energy is always the same, uh, except at the moment of the Big Bang when it all appeared from nowhere. Um, that's, uh, then the third dogma is similar to that, the laws of nature are fixed. The laws and constants of the world are the same today as they were at the moment of the Big Bang, uh, when they all suddenly appeared like a kind of cosmic Napoleonic code. As Terence McKenna used to say, uh, modern science is based on the principle, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. <laughs> and <clears throat> the one free miracle is the appearance of all the matter and energy in the universe and all the laws that govern it from nothing in a single instant. The uh, fourth dogma uh, is that matter is unconscious. The universe is made up of totally unconscious matter. Fifth, nature is purposeless. There are no purposes in nature, and um, the evolutionary process has no purpose or direction. Sixth, biological inheritance is material. It's genetic in the genetic material DNA, or possibly in epigenetic modifications of the DNA, which are also chemical, or in cytoplasmic inheritance, but at any rate, it's all material. Seven, Memories are stored as material traces inside the brain. Everything you remember is somewhere inside your head as a stored memory, either in phosphorylated proteins, modified synapses, or some material form which has not yet been fully identified. Uh, they, so the details are very vague. 
uh, attempts to find these traces have failed over and over again, but nevertheless, it's universally believed within neuroscience that they're all inside the brain. Uh, dogma eight, the mind is inside the head. Mental activity is brain activity. Uh, your mind is nothing but uh, what goes on in your brain. Dogma nine follows from dogma eight, psychic phenomena are illusory. Um, things like telepathy can't really happen because they would imply the mind can work at a distance from the body and it can't do that because it's all inside the head. And dogma 10, mechanistic medicine is the only kind that really works. Alternative and complementary therapies may appear to work, but that's only because people would have got better anyway or it's all the placebo effect. But the real kind, the only kind that really works is mechanistic medicine, which is why in most parts of the world it's the only kind taught in medical schools, it's the only kind funded by uh, government funding agencies and so on. Well, these are the ten beliefs which are more or less the default belief system of most scientists and, and most educated people today. Wherever they are in the world, in India or China or wherever, this is the belief system which is predominant. Now, within science itself, of course, people at the leading edge of research in many ways have moved beyond this belief system. Research scientists are not necessarily committed to this in every detail, but they're usually only at the frontier of one region. A, a, a physicist might be at the frontiers of cosmology and have gone beyond some of these dogmas of physics, but that they wouldn't question the dogmas of psychology or biology. Those would remain more or less intact. So there are various people who question bits of it, uh, but uh, there's very little that's been done to question the whole thing. This is essentially the materialist world view, and uh, it became the dominant view of science in the 19th century. Uh, science was, as it were, hijacked by materialist philosophy and since then has been a wholly owned subsidiary of materialism. There's re no reason why society, science has to be materialist. It wasn't materialist before the 19th century. It was dualist, as I'll say soon. And I think we can go beyond that uh, to a new, more inclusive, more organic, uh, organismic paradigm for science. What I'm going to do first is look at the dogma that the total amount of matter and energy is always the same. This got built into the foundations of science in the 17th century. Um, it was not brought about by incredibly detailed observations using nanogram balances and so forth. It came about for purely philosophical or rather theological reasons. The founding fathers of modern science were all uh, Christians who believed that the world was a machine, that God was a machine maker, an engineering, mathematically minded God who'd created the world machine, and he'd started off the world machine in the first place <coughs> um, by creating the matter that's in it, which he created in the form of atoms, taking the idea from Greek atomism. And these atoms, by definition, couldn't be destroyed. They couldn't be broken up. So once God had created them, the total amount of atoms or matter must automatically remain the same forever. And God also endowed the universe with a certain quantum of movement or force uh, which started it in motion. And thereafter, because this God-given force couldn't be changed by anything else, uh, the amount remained the same. So the principles of conservation of matter and energy were built into science from the outset. Um, not on the basis of detailed measurements. They've served as useful accountancy principles ever since, but they were formulated more rigorously in the mid-19th century in the law of conservation of matter and energy uh, and in the first law of, cons uh, of thermodynamics. <clears throat> so it was assumed that that was the end of the matter and that they were fixed forever, and most people take that for granted today. They've learned it in high school, and they see never see any reason to question it. This was the dogma of science which I myself didn't question until quite recently. I'd questioned all the others, but it was only when I was writing this book that I thought I should look at this one. Um, and I actually rather wanted it to turn out to be true because I thought if I uh, said that all 10 dogmas of science were false, it might sound a bit biased. So I thought it'd be quite nice if one of them held up. And I thought this was the best candidate. Um, but when I thought about it, it turned out to be a, a shambles. Um, First of all, we're, physicists are above the law and they've found themselves quite free to invent or hypothesize 
forms of matter and energy that which no one had ever thought of before. One of them is, of course, dark matter. Observations of galaxies and the way that stars moved within them, and also the ways that galaxies interact with each other, suggested that the galaxies, if they were to be explained in terms of gravitation, uh, simply wouldn't work. Uh, the, the whole thing simply didn't work. So in order to make it work, they hypothesized there was extra matter, uh, which you can't see, hence the name dark matter, uh, that uh, accounted for all the phenomena of galaxies and their interactions. Well, how much dark matter was there? Well, simple. Just invent the exact amount you need to explain the observed phenomena. Uh, you can titrate the amount of dark matter at will uh, to uh, explain the phenomena you're trying to explain. If you find new phenomena, peculiar bulges in galaxies or something that uh, 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 one size fits all dark matter won't explain, then you add a bit more where it's needed. The system works perfectly and you can explain everything with complete accuracy uh, because you can change the amount at, at will. Um, the only trouble is no one knows what it is and there's no independent evidence for it. People have been speculating about its nature ever since it was first postulated. Um, having created all this extra matter in the universe, uh, then this meant there should be more gravitation. And physicists expected in the 1990s that the universal expansion from the Big Bang would slow down. Uh, the universe would stop expanding, then been, begin to contract under the influence of all this gravitational matter uh, until it ended in tears in the reverse of the Big Bang, uh, known in the trade as the Big Crunch. So um, this, uh, the, uh, when in the late 1990s people observed that the universe appeared to be accelerating because of red shifts in distant quasars and so on, and galaxies, um, uh, then there was the problem, how do you explain this acceleration? Well, the answer was ready to hand, a new form of energy no one had known about before, uh, which caused the universe to expand. How much is there? Well, just the right amount to explain the facts. Uh, so we now have dark matter and dark energy uh, as huge amount of the universe. They currently make up about 96% of reality. Now, physicists have invented something like 20 times more energy and matter than anyone had ever heard of till the 1980s. And no one's uh, said, oh, you can't do that. It's defying the law of conservation of matter and energy. And if you ask, is all this matter and energy conserved, is the total amount always the same? Well, for dark matter, nobody knows. For dark energy, the most usual theory is that actually the amount's increasing. As the universe expands, there's more dark energy. The universe is now a perpetual motion machine. So the idea it's all rigorously conserved doesn't really make much sense in those terms. There's also, the, within uh, quantum physics, uh, uh, zero-point energy, uh, a form of uh, energy which is supposed to be there underlying the world we live in, which is like waves on an ocean of energy. Um, and there's huge amounts of it. The amount in a teaspoon would be enough to power the United States for years. Um, not surprisingly, some people claim that they can tap this energy and have devices which uh, tap unconventional or unknown forms of energy, including zero-point energy. Um, if you go online, you'll find there are many people who claim to have above unity devices, machines that produce more energy than you put into them. Well, these are immediately banned from regular science because they violate the first of science's taboos established by Galileo in the early 17th century, the taboo against perpetual motion machines. This taboo long predated the laws of thermodynamics, uh, and it's one of the most deep-seated taboos in science. So things like cold fusion or uh, above unity devices or free energy devices, whether they're based on zero point energy or peculiar electromagnetic effects or parametric resonance or the various other theories that are used to explain them, are totally beyond the pale. Nevertheless, people claim they've got them and they exist. If they do exist, of course, it would totally transform the world economy and the world energy situation. So do they really work? Well, right now, it's very, very hard to find out because there's claims that may or may not be substantiated. There's a universal rejection within orthodox science of this. A few people within the Department of Defense, a few people uh, who are a kind of maverick in, in investors are interested in this. The Japanese government's interested, but basically, uh, they're not part of the normal discourse of science. 
I myself think the best way forward here would be to have a prize, say a million dollar prize for the best above unity device. And those who claim to have them could then have them tested. This is not an attempt to debunk them. Uh, it's an attempt to see what really works. They'd be tested under fair, agreed conditions. And if any of them do indeed produce more energy than is put into them, and that, uh, uh, which can't be explained in terms of any known energy source, they'd win the prize. If the several do, then the best one would win the prize. I think this would be the best way of bringing this whole thing out into the open and finding out what's really going on. Um, and I think that, con uh, that uh, uh, commercial betting companies uh, could open a book on this as well, and people could <laughs> bet on whether the prize would be awarded. Um, uh, then all those skeptics who say it's impossible could put their money where their mouth is and bet a million dollars that uh, no one would win the prize. Uh, how much would they actually be prepared to bet? That would be a very interesting question. I'd be prepared to bet at least a thousand dollars that someone would win it. Um, so I think this would put the thing totally into the public domain. The media would love it. Everyone would be discussing it. And if someone won it, I think it would completely change the climate. I think investors would get interested, governments, how it works, and the situation could move on. Right now, we've been at a stalemate for years with these things. It turns out that in biology, the whole question of energy conservation is much, much more questionable than most people assume. We all assume that the total amount of energy uh, that we produce can be explained by the food we take in. And this was as assumed in the 1850s by Hermann von Helmholtz, who was eager to prove that living organisms were nothing but machines. He didn't prove it, he assumed it, and since then it's been a basic dogma of biology. It wasn't tested in humans until 1899 by two American researchers called Atwater and Benedict, and they were determined to prove that we're nothing but machines. They were mechanists, and they started from the assumption this was true, and they did the experiments not to find out if it was true or not, but, as they put it, to demonstrate it uh, in order to further the cause of science. They had people in calorimeters and measured all the heat produced, the carbon dioxide, the oxygen taken in, feces, urine, food consumed, and so on, did a complete energy balance sheet. When they did it, the results came out wrong. So they changed the correction factors for the value of food until they got the expected result. Um, and this then became uh, built into the foundations of biology as a certain fact. It wasn't re-examined uh, till an uh, uh, independent-minded American nutritionist, Paul Webb, redid their experiments in the 1970s. He found huge discrepancies. People who were overweight, overeating, and doing very little exercise seemed to have 25% or so of the energy just vanish. People who were not eating and doing exercise gained about 25% too much energy. Where was it coming from? Nobody knows. He called it X, the unexplained amount of energy that could either be disappear or appear. He then re-examined Atwater and Benedict's results and found that they'd got similar discrepancies, but they'd made sure there were just as many people who had too much and too little, so that when they averaged them, it cancelled out to give the expected result. <laughs> there are people who claim there are other forms of energy, chi, prana, vital energies, and so on. Uh, and these are usually treated as metaphoric, but they may be much more literal than we usually think. And this is a huge uh, unexplored area. It's not as if nutrition science is the most successful branch of modern biology. Um, and uh, I think that this is something which uh, bears re-examination. In my book, I suggest several uh, quite radical experiments that could be done quite simply and cheaply to look at this. <clears throat> well, now let me turn briefly to the idea that the laws and constants of nature are fixed. The idea of the laws are fixed is a hangover from Greek philosophy. Uh, Plato and Pythagoras thought that the world was governed by mathematical principles beyond space and time, eternal ideas. In the 17th century, people thought these were ideas in the mind of a mathematical god, and uh, that god had these uh, mathematical ideas, and that scientists were actually finding out about the mind of god by finding out the maths of nature. People thought Newton's laws of gravitation were not just human hypotheses, mere guesses, or mere working principles. They thought this was a direct insight into the divine mind superior to that of religion, much more precise, much less disputable. And this was really the basis for uh, enlightenment 
ideology of science and reason. They thought science and reason transcended uh, 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 religion in giving a direct insight into the divine nature. Now, you don't hear much about that today, but um, there, there's still uh, this strong enlightenment tradition, um, and the idea of the laws of nature are fixed is a hangover from that point of view. But in a radically evolutionary universe, which the Big Bang postulates, uh, why shouldn't the laws of nature themselves evolve? In fact, why should there be laws at all? Law is a very human metaphor. Only humans have laws and only civilized societies. Um, why should we project this anthropocentric metaphor onto the whole of nature? I myself think that the idea of habits of nature makes much better sense. Um, this is the basis of my own idea of morphic resonance, which is a memory principle in nature. But I'm not the first to propose habits. The American philosopher C.S. Peirce, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, suggested that in an evolutionary universe, uh, the regularities would be, uh, could be thought of as evolving habits. I think it's a much better way to think of it. Um, and it's a testable hypothesis. The theory of morphic resonance predicts, for example, that if you crystallize a new chemical compound for the first time, it may be very difficult to crystallize because it hasn't yet got a habit to crystallize in with a particular lattice structure. But if you crystallize it again somewhere else, uh, there'll be a resonance from the first crystals across space and time, morphic resonance, that will make it easier to crystallize. And the third time, it'll be easier still because of resonance from the first and the second crystals. It'll get easier and easier to crystallize all around the world. There's a lot of evidence that that really happens. Chemists explain it by saying there must have been uh, 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 frag uh, fragments of previous crystals must have been wafted around the world as dust particles, uh, but I'm predicting the same will happen even, even if you filter dust particles out of the air. The theory also predicts that if you train an animal, say rats, uh, to learn a new trick, if you train rats in Albuquerque to learn a new trick, then all over the world, rats in New York and London and Tokyo should learn the same trick quicker just because the rats have learned it here. Surprisingly, there's already evidence from experiments with a long series of experiments with rats done at Harvard, at the University of Edinburgh, and the University of Melbourne, Australia, that this actually happens. The same applies to people. It should be getting easier to learn things that others have already learned. Well, I'm not going to go into detail on this because this is the theme of my own theory of morphic resonance, and my purpose in this lecture and in my book is not really so much to push my own ideas as to show how questionable the standard ones are and how much we can, uh, the, the field is open for different answers. But I'll turn just briefly to the constants of nature because this affects the electric universe or indeed any model of the universe. Um, it's assumed that the constants of nature are constant, the fundamental constants like Newton's gravitational constant, big G, or the speed of light, C. Well, I began to wonder whether they really were constant when I got into the habit view of nature. Um, and so I tried to find out what the actual values were. Uh, I started off by getting handbooks of physical constants uh, and looking at old editions. Most people only look at the latest edition, but I, and they usually throw the old ones away. But I, in the patent office library in London, I found they kept them all. And so I got them all out of the reserve stock uh, at 10-year ten ten intervals. They wheeled in a trolley of handbooks of physical constant, dusting them off. And I looked through these things to see uh, how they changed. To my amazement, I found that the speed of light dropped by 20 kilometers per second between 1928 and 1945. I then looked up the data in more detail and found that all over the world, people have been getting this much lower figure with very small error bars. The original figure is up there with little error bars, and it goes down much lower with little error bars. It wasn't as if the error bars were 20 kilometers per second. No, they were f point decimal places of kilometers per second. Um, <clears throat> I checked in the primary literature and found this indeed seemed to be the case. And then they went up again after 1945. I couldn't understand what was going on, so I asked the head of the metrology department, metrologists are the people who measure constants, at the British National Physical Laboratory if I could go and see him, and I went to visit him. He was very friendly. And I said to him, uh, Dr. Petley, uh, I'd like to know how you explain this drop in the speed of light between 1928 and 1945. Um, and he said, oh dear, 
I said, what? And he said, you've uncovered one of the most embarrassing incidents in the history of our subject. <coughs> uh, so, so I said, well, could it mean that the speed of light really did drop, at least as measured on Earth during that period? He said, oh, of course not. And I said, why not? He said, because it's a constant. <laughs> and, so I said, well, then, I can't see any other explanation than that people all around the world were sort of fudging their results uh, to get what they thought everyone else would expect them to get, and then discarding outliers and stuff, and, 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 and coming up with these very, these very, the very narrow error, error bars that agreed with everyone else. And so it, then it must have been produced by some kind of fudging process. He said, we don't like to use the word fudge. <laughs> and so, so I said, what do you prefer? And, uh, he said, we prefer to call it intellectual phase locking. <laughs> um, so I said to him, well, if it was happening then, how do we know it's not happening now? And he said, oh, we know it's not happening now. And I said, why? He said, because we fixed the speed of light by definition in 1972. <laughs> uh, so I said, well, it might still vary. And he leaned back, looking very smug, and said, well, if it did, no one would ever find out, because we've defined, we've defined the meter in terms of the speed of light. So the units would vary with it. So I said, well, OK, you've fixed that one, but what about the gravitational constant? I said, that's been varying wildly. Um, and even actually in the last three, three or four years, it's varied by more than 1.3%, as measured in different laboratories. The usual assumption is this is just error. And it's experimental error, it's hard to measure, it's uh, error. Um, so labs all over the world get quite different results. And the International Committee on Metrology um, fixes the results every few years by averaging ones from different labs, weighting ones they think are more reliable, discarding ones they think are not. Um, and indeed, when I left Dr. Petley, thanking him for his time, he reached down to a cardboard box beside his desk full of pamphlets. He said, by the way, these have just come from the printers. You might like one. He handed me this pamphlet, the latest values of the physical constants. Um, <laughs> so uh, um, so um, I, I looked at these data from different labs on G, big G. And in one or two, uh, the question that I was wondering is, there's all these big errors. Could it be that they're actually changing together in different labs as the Earth rotates around the sun, as it rotates during the day, and as the whole solar system moves through different astronomical environments? To find that out, one would look, look at the day-by-day -day measurements from different labs and see if the errors or so-called errors are correlated. I've spent more than 10 years trying to persuade metrologists to do this, and they simply will not because they say it's a constant, so there's no point looking for variations. But I say, you've got these huge differences. And they say, oh, they're just errors. It's hard to measure. But they simply won't do it. An exercise in open science would be if they put their raw data with the dates online, and then there could be an, uh, uh, anyone could try and look for patterns, and there could be a website where they're discussed. I think it would cost nothing, and we might find something out. We'll find out nothing by pretending it's fixed. Um, there are, in fact, already papers that suggest diurnal variations in, in accordance with the sidereal day. Uh, a group at MIT recently found a daily variation, and there's some evidence of annual variations. But there may be other wilder fluctuations uh, that happen in concert. I myself think the so-called physical constants may vary from time to time, in, uh, possibly even chaotically, within certain limits. But I think the day may come when in scientific periodicals like Nature, there'd be a page a bit like the stock market reports, you know, <laughs> this week's value of the constants, you know. <laughs> this week the G was slightly up, the charge on the electron held steady, there was a drop in the fine structure constant, you know. Um, and, and if that were ca the case, then it would give varying qualities of time when different things could happen. The idea they're all rigidly fixed is a hangover from an old platonic point of way, uh, way of thinking. So there, right in the heart of physics, is, I think, a really open and interesting question.